Well, this morning is the fourth Sunday of Advent. And in this entire Advent season, we've been in a series that we're calling Much, Abundance in a Time of Scarcity. And we're in this series because often at this time of year, we experience a a scarcity of, of internal resources. We have this feeling, this sense that there's not enough within us to go around to get everything done that we're trying to get done and to enjoy the most, what's at least supposed to be the most wonderful time of year. That we have this sense that we don't have enough within us to give everything we want. And I'm not just talking about gifts. I'm talking about the time. I'm talking about the attention. We don't have enough to give everyone we want. And so we wonder frequently, and I find myself wondering during Christmas season, is it possible to have a different kind of Christmas? Is it possible to rather than just be spent and exhausted and poured out, is it possible to be filled up, to have an abundance within, to be filled in such a way that our lives are overflowing, that we have more to give to others around us and to sustain us well beyond Christmas? And each week we've been looking at the reality that in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that good news, there is an abundance of resources for us. We've looked at how there is an abundance of hope, there's an abundance of faith, there's an abundance of joy. And so if you find yourself lacking any of these resources, I'd encourage you to go back, if you haven't listened to it, listen to those messages and even more so seek God as the one who wants to give you those resources this time of year. You can find that on our podcast or on our YouTube channel, PCTRNJ. If you can't find it, need help, we'd love to help you. Today we're going to look at peace. And and as I I was thinking about this message all week, I happened to watch National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, which is definitely up there on the list for me of necessary movies in this season. And there's this scene in the movie where Clark and Ellen Griswold are there in bed at the end of a long day, and Ellen says to Clark that, her, she just got off the phone with her parents, and they are going to come for Christmas this year in addition to his parents. They're all going to stay under one roof. And he is thrilled. He's excited because he's always wanted to have a big family Christmas. And she is very concerned because all she's picturing are the arguments. My mother accusing your mother of buying cheap hot dogs. Your mother accusing my mother of waxing her upper lip. She's just envisioning the chaos that's going to come with it. And she says to him at one point, I know how you build things up in your mind, Sparky. You set standards that no family event could ever live up to. She knows he sets these standards, these expectations in his mind of how this is all going to go. And it's going to be epic. You ever do that? I mean, maybe you don't have 25,000 twinkle lights on the exterior of your home. But do you ever set yourself up with those kinds of expectations? I think we do. I think it's not just about Christmas. And we're going to do whatever it takes to make this work. It's going to be perfect. And yet we find ourselves so often as a result of that disappointed, frustrated, stressed about the arguments, about the unmet expectations, about our failure to make it all happen. And so is it possible in the midst of the stress and the expectations and the chaos to have peace? Genuine peace. A peace that lasts. And what is that peace like and how can we get it? Those are the questions that we're going to be asking as we jump into this passage today from Luke chapter 12. And if you'd like to follow along on the screen, you are welcome to. But hear this word from God to us this morning. Then Jesus said to his disciples... Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? 
And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and all these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you his, the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let's pray as we move into this word together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time to gather in this place. We thank you for the Christmas season and how we get to intentionally seek you, remember you and what you've done for us in this miracle that is Christmas. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, to be the one leading our thoughts, guiding the meditations of our hearts and shaping us ultimately so that you can fill us with your peace. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So Jesus begins this passage with a very simple, straightforward command. Do not worry about your life. How are you doing at that? I mean, we know that worrying is not really very helpful. It's not very good for us. And yet, it seems that we can't stop it just because we know. In fact, we keep doing it a lot. All of the research shows that we collectively as a society, as Americans, are the most anxious we've ever been on on record and perhaps in all of history. And certainly the last months of COVID have only inflamed that. And so Jesus here speaks a word 2,000 years ago that is just as relevant as if then as it is and maybe even more so now. Do not worry about your life, about your existence, about everything that you need that makes life happen. And here he speaks very clearly about the most basic things. Don't worry about food. Don't worry about clothing. And what he's getting at is you don't need to worry about the things that you need, the things that are most basic, that are necessary for life. And if you don't need to worry about the things that are necessary for life, then you certainly don't need to worry about all the things that are unnecessary in life. You know, worry is the opposite of peace. Worry is that tendency to look out into what is uncertain, that is out of our control, and then just obsess over it. Looking at life and thinking about all of the, the future and the what ifs, and what do I need to do about it? And, and I wonder why is it that when we look out into the future, we think about all those what ifs, why is it that we tend to only think about all the what ifs of how it's going to go wrong? And we rarely, if ever, think about the what-ifs and how it could go not only right, but maybe even better than we possibly hoped for. That when the in-laws come and they sit at the table, it's not going to be arguments. There's going to be delightful conversation. We're going to break out in singing. You seem a little skeptical. But we do. We think about what all the things that are going to go wrong. And worrying isn't just about the future. Absolutely, we can worry just as much about the past. Have you ever found yourself at the end of a day replaying that conversation over and over in your head and obsessing over what you said, what you didn't say, how you could have said it differently and what might happen next? You can't change it now and yet you can still worry about it now, can't you? So we can worry about the future, we can worry about the past and Jesus is saying, come on, get in the present. Do not worry. Because here in the present, in this moment, Jesus is saying, God wants you to have peace. He wants you to have that sense, that state of stability, of security, of contentment, of wholeness, of well-being, a sense of calmness and confidence that life is going to work. Maybe not all of the ways you want it to, but all of the ways you need it to. And so he gives the command. Do not worry about your life. But, man, it's way harder to do than it is to say, isn't it? And, and really, I don't know about you, but just being told to do something, especially like worrying in the moment, don't worry. If you're in the moment, it's pretty hard to turn it off, isn't it? And so I'm glad that Jesus doesn't just give us the command and then walk away. He actually gives us in this passage, he tells us how we can begin to live differently. How we can begin to live so that worry does not consume us, so that we can receive peace. And the answer is we're to consider and we're to seek. 
So he first gives two examples from nature and says, consider. First, he says, consider the ravens, those nasty little birds. And they would have been to the people in Jesus' day, to the Jewish people, ravens were unclean. They were ceremonially unclean. They weren't fit to be sacrificed in the temple. They certainly couldn't be eaten. If you touched them, it made you unclean, so you couldn't go into the temple for worship. So these were nasty little birds. And yet Jesus uses them as the example. He says, consider the ravens. Consider those birds that you despise, maybe for us it's like pigeons or crows or I'm not sure what kind of nasty little bird comes to mind for you, but it doesn't reap or sow. It's not a farmer. It's not planting anything. It's not harvesting any crops. It has no barns. It has no storehouses. It has no refrigerators. It has nothing to store up its food. It's not, it's not working long hours. It's not putting in extra hours at the tree. It's not laboring or toiling. It's not worrying about where its next meal is going to come from. And Jesus is saying, pause and consider that. God feeds them still. God feeds that lowly animal consistently each and every day. He takes care of it. And so the raven, as a result, is content to be the raven. And so Jesus says, consider how much more valuable you are than the birds. You are valuable to God, more so, clearly more so than the birds. And he cares for them. Will he not also care for you? And so who of us, by worrying, can add a single hour to our life? A single moment, a single length. You know, and and the reality is, we know the answer is none. We can do all of the right things to take care of our body, do all of the right things to promote health, And yet, we probably all know stories of those who have been the most fit among us and they have experienced a heart attack. Or a a car accident cuts life short. We can't add a moment to our lives. And yet, for God, it is simple to add a moment to our lives. For God, it's simple to expand life for us, and yet for us, it's impossible. And Jesus is saying, you can't do this simple little thing. This is nothing for God. And yet you're worrying about everything else on top of it. You can't even give yourself life. And yet you continue to worry and worry and worry. I mean, Jesus is giving us this command. Don't worry because it's not going to work for you. And, And you're so much more valuable than the birds. Oh yeah, and consider also, consider the wildflowers. They don't labor or spin. I mean, I don't know about you. I have yet to see a flower going trying to grow. You know, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Right? I've never seen a flower doing that. A flower is not working at growing. A flower instead simply receives, receives the sun, receives the rain, receives and accepts the soil that it's been planted in, and then it grows quite naturally. And and Jesus says, quite beautifully. So much so that even Solomon, in all of his splendor, this was the most elaborate, ornate, beautiful clothing that these people could even have imagined. And Jesus is saying, it's nothing compared to the beauty of the wildflowers on the hills. And yet their life is short. Here today, gone tomorrow, they're withered up, and all they're good for at that point is to be thrown into the fire to heat up the ovens. And yet God clothes them this beautifully. If this is how he clothes the grass and the flowers of the field, how much more will he clothe you? Because you are so much more valuable than a flower and you last so much longer. Don't you believe? That's what he says. You have little faith. Don't you believe? Don't you trust? Don't you trust that God values you more than the birds and the flowers? And yet, if we look at our lives, perhaps when we worry like we don't believe it. Jesus goes on, he says, do not set your hearts on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for for the pagan world runs after such things, and your Father knows you need them. And and what he's saying is those, those who do not believe in God, in this personal God, they're the ones who worry. The uh, the other gods in Jesus' day were, were not, they were impersonal forces. They were gods who didn't actually care about people. The belief was you, just, you had to just kind of try to appease them to hope that they'd do something that would benefit you, like send some rain or the sun or give fertility or whatever it is. But it wasn't because they actually cared about the people. And Jesus is saying, hey, your, your God, the true God, is like a father who loves you, who cares for you, who values you, who uses his ability, his power for your benefit. 
And yet you're worrying, you're acting like you don't even believe in God. You're running and you're striving after the things that those who have no faith strive after. Setting your heart on these things. What he's saying is that you believe that you will only have peace if you can attain it. You'll only have peace if you can control the outcomes of your life. You'll only have peace if you can orchestrate a perfect Christmas. You will only have peace if you can execute the perfect business plan. You'll only have peace if you can guide this relationship to the place where you want it to be. You'll only have peace if that person is okay. You'll only have peace if you can protect them. You'll only have peace if your kids are well-adjusted. You'll only have peace if somehow you can control it and attain it. Only then. Only then will you have peace. And so we spend our lives running after them and striving for them, setting our heart on them, even though we know we probably shouldn't. And yet we keep doing it. There's a friend of mine who introduced me to a book called Dreams of the Overworked by Christine Beckman and Melissa Masmanian. And this book is the result of following nine American families over the course of three years and observing their life day in and day out trying to understand it. Followed some single parents, followed families that had dual incomes, followed families that had only one of the parents working outside of the home. And what they discovered, what they found among all of these families is that they were anxious, exhausted, and frantic. That they couldn't seem to exert the control over their lives that they wanted in order to have the peace that they were craving. And so they concluded in this book that all of this worry, all of this anxiousness, it, it comes from three dominant cultural myths in America. These three kind of thought patterns and worldviews, these myths that we we tend to build our lives around. And the myth is the ideal worker, the perfect parent, and the ultimate body. You know, the the ideal worker is that worker that desires to be loyal, a competent colleague, well-liked, successful in all of their professional endeavors. The ideal worker, they say, has no competing obligations that might get in the way of total devotion to the workplace. No competing obligations. They're available anytime to address any issue or concern that may arise, and of course that makes them sought at, sought after uh, by employers. The ideal worker, busyness is a mark of elite status and a demonstration of efficiency and worth. We talk about how technology is enabling this myth because you don't actually have to be at the workplace to be an ideal worker. You can be stopped at a stoplight and responding to a text or an email. You can be at a concert or a soccer game. You can be wherever, anywhere, always available to be an ideal worker on call all the time. Congratulations. And then put that next to this myth of the perfect parent. In this myth, the, the perfect parent is is dedicating their entire self to raising children. With this myth, there's an expectation that parents will put their their children's needs before their own. This parent is dedicated, they say, to quality family time, provides numerous enrichment activities, monitors children's behavior, limiting screen time, and making sure they are on top of homework, and always puts family first. Always puts family first. Well, you probably have already picked up the challenge. One of the problems If you are totally devoted to work, available all the time, and always put family first, it sets up a bit of a crisis, doesn't it? An impossibility, a contradiction, because at some point you're going to have to choose one or the other. At least that is if you haven't figured out how to be in two places at the same time. If you have, let me know. I haven't figured that one out. I'm open. It would be certainly very helpful in the pursuit of all of these myths. Right, because at some point, we see that these myths start to butt heads. And then you add onto it the myth of the ultimate body, where in the big picture, the, the ultimate body is about achieving health and energy and, and longevity. At least that's what's said. But frequently what's meant is it's about looking good. It's about how we appear. It's, it's that pressure that we feel from the outside or even from the inside as we look out and we see in advertisements and billboards, we look at the unrealistic presentations of the human form. And we say, yes, that, that is the ultimate body and I will pursue it. 
And so you got to constantly watch your calories. you got to make sure that you get every single workout in. And then, so here's the challenge. If you need to be wor at work at 7 a.m. in order to be the ideal worker, when does the workout have to get in? Maybe four? Five? And, and if you had to respond to emails at 11 in order to be that ideal worker, but you couldn't get to it till after 8.30 because you put the kids to bed after giving them all baths and reading bedtime stories for at least a half an hour and then singing to them while stroking their back while they fall to sleep because you're a perfect parent, when does the workout happen? And how much sleep can you get? Not enough. And so the sleep has to give, or the workout has to give, and so much for the ultimate body and health. And when we step back and we look at it and we see the patterns in our lives and in our society, we see this cycle over and over, and we can describe it, and we can look at it, and we can say, man, yeah, that's probably not great, and yet we still keep trying to go after it. That was their conclusion. Actually, they identify what you probably already know. The fact that these myths are in competition with each other masks a deeper truth. It is fundamentally impossible to achieve even one of the myths, no less all three. One does not reach the status of ideal worker, perfect parent, or ultimate body. Success is not an end state. Instead, people experience elusive moments of success, and that's the problem. That's it. We get those elusive moments of success in the midst of the, the broader life. It's like, it's like if you've ever played golf. Now, let's get honest. None of us are good at golf. Okay, maybe a few, but not many. And, but if you've ever played golf and you've hit that shot, that perfect shot, that one, that, that's enough to make you go back for more and, and get abused again and again just to get that experience of that one shot. And there's other places in life where you have that euphoric moment that seems to pay off for all of the pain and all of the struggle. And that's what they're describing. These moments of success in our lives where peace seems to be present. They go on and they say it's that moment where checking email on a Sunday and you know that the project someone is waiting for has been sent off. Ideal worker. Looking around the table during a family dinner when everyone is laughing and chatting. That perfect Christmas moment. Perfect parent. Or enjoying the endorphins after a long run, pursuing the ultimate body. It's these little moments, success, these glimpses of peace, and we want it. And we convince ourselves somehow that if we can have it just for this moment, then yes, it is possible to attain it always. And so we keep striving. And we keep striving. Knowing somewhere in the back of our mind that it will never be enough, knowing we can't do it, knowing that these things are in competition and yet continuing to strive. And Jesus is warning us. He's warning us very clearly, don't set your heart on these things. Don't run frantically and worrying as if God isn't going to provide you enough to be a good worker, a good parent, and have a healthy body. See, because no, none of those are bad things. As a matter of fact, we should be a good worker. You've been given gifts and talents and abilities that you should be using to be a productive, contributing member of society to help build things up, to help provide for yourself, for your family, for others. We should be good parents and grandparents, investing ourselves deeply in those who have been entrusted to us, who are closest to us in our home. We're supposed to take care of our bodies. I mean, we're told very clearly in the scripture that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's not even yours. It was purchased at the cost of Jesus' body, and so it belongs to him. And so should we not take care of Jesus' property? Yes, all of those things are true. And I do know that for some, the pursuit of the ultimate body is not about perfecting your look and your appearance. I know that it's actually about a failing body and your struggle to maintain the body that you have. The struggle that has filled up your life to this point that it's all consuming doctor appointment after doctor's appointment, filling your schedule and your soul with anxiety and worry and stress. There's no peace. Jesus is saying, don't set your heart on these things, on these cultural myths. Instead, if you want peace, if you want abundant peace in your life, seek. Seek his kingdom, the kingdom of God, and these things will be given to you as well. Seek his kingdom, not your kingdom, not my kingdom, 
I think so much of our problem is that we are striving to build our kingdoms where we can be the queens and the kings over our little territory where we get to call the shots, where we do what we want, when we want, how we want it, and it all works out. Everything working together for our good, for our enjoyment, for our peace. Now, don't get me wrong. We're benevolent dictators. And so we're good to all of those who are under our rule, but we're still seeking it to be our kingdom, working together for our peace And if we can just build that kingdom right, then we can have it. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 it's not about your kingdom. It's about God's kingdom. What does it look like to seek his kingdom? I think first is to consider our values, to think about why is it that we're on the hamster wheel in the first place? Why is it that we've bought into and continue to to pursue these cultural myths and other patterns in our lives that don't seem to promote peace but seem to continue to raise the worry and the anxiety? It doesn't seem to be working, and yet we continue to be pursuing them. And I think it's because our values are out of order. That we're valuing our ability to perfectly orchestrate our lives rather than valuing the reality that, that God has orchestrated life for you. And even more than just his values as in his ethics and his morals, it's that he values you. Recognizing that he values you and not the ideal perfect you that you're pursuing according to the myths, but the you that is you today and the you that he's making you to become in the future. That he values you. He loves you. And when we orient our, our lives around this truth, then we don't need to set up for ourselves a little kingdom to secure our peace. Instead, we can seek his kingdom, reorder our lives according to his values. We can become people of generosity. As he called, as Jesus says, hey, give it away. Don't squirrel it away. Don't hoard it. Don't keep it for yourself. As if your peace and your security and your stability relies on your ability to acquire this this money and wealth, give it away. That's a part of, you want to have peace around money, give it away. Be generous and know that he's going to provide what you need. We can become people who forgive even when the things that have been done against us are so grievous, so wrong, we can barely even talk about them. But in his kingdom, we can forgive. We can be people of patience in a world of pushiness. We can be a people of courage and boldness, of radical love, of hospitality, of justice, of hope. We can be people who observe the Sabbath day. We can actually rest instead of continuing to toil. We can be people who recognize that I'm living in the kingdom of God, not in my own kingdom, but the kingdom of God where he is the king, I am not. He is in control, I am not. He calls the shots, I do not. And man, when we live in that kingdom, then we can have genuine peace because we no longer have to strive to hold it all together and to control the outcomes that are beyond our ability to control because he's in control and will give you everything that you need, including his peace. But man, to have that peace, we've got to embrace our limitations. We've got limits. You're not God, and neither am I. Ruth Haley Barton wrote a book called Strengthening the Soul of Your Leadership. And she says this, when, when we refuse to live within limits, we're refusing to live with a basic reality of human existence. There is a finiteness to what I can do in this body. There is a finiteness to how many relationships I can engage in meaningfully at one time. There is a finiteness to time, how many hours there are in a day, how many days there are in a week, and how much can be done in those blocks of time. There is a finiteness to my energy. There comes a time when I am tired. There comes a time when I am sick. There comes a time when I am injured. These are times when I am reminded that I am human. A finite being living in the presence of an infinite God. God is the infinite one. God is the one who can be all things to all people. God is the one who can be in all places at once. God is the one who never sleeps. I am not. If we want peace, an abundance of peace, we have got to embrace the reality of our limitations. That we cannot meet everyone's expectations. We can't even meet all of our own expectations. That there are only so many things that you can get done in a day. If you're a person who who makes lists and maybe you only get one of them checked off because you did 17 other things that weren't on the list, but you're convinced that you're going to finish all of the rest of them in the last eight minutes of a day and then it doesn't end up happening. And if you're that kind of person that can only have peace if they're all checked off, and Jesus is saying, stop. 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 Embrace your limits. You are finite. You are created. You are loved. You are valued by the infinite God of the universe who never sleeps, 
who is available at all times in a way you cannot be. He's the source of your peace. And so we can embrace our limits and we can embrace the practices that help us practice those limits, like observing the Sabbath, like we read about earlier. When we think about Sabbath, we usually think about a day off or maybe about the weekend. But that's not exactly it. When the Sabbath was given to the Jewish people, Sure, it was, there was no work to be done that day, either in the home or out of the home. So no cooking, no cleaning, no extras. That's what the Sabbath was about. But it was not just so that they would somehow get rest. It was also, he said very clearly in Exodus 31, so that you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. See, to embrace the Sabbath and the practices of rest and, and is, to, is to say, No, I'm going to embrace my limits. I'm going to get off the hamster wheel. And yes, I understand there may be some opportunities and some things that pass me by in this life, but I'm going to embrace this limitation because it reminds me that I am not God and he is. And I'm going to seek his kingdom, his values, and him as my king. And when we seek him as the king, in his kingdom, all those things that we need, that we worry about constantly, will be given to us as well. And God is pleased to give you his kingdom. Did you see Jesus say that? He's pleased. He's not trying to withhold peace from you. He's not trying to withhold what what you need. He is pleased to give you his kingdom when you seek it. He's pleased to give you his peace. And he's pleased because of Christmas. Because at Christmas, the God who knew no limits, the God who is infinite, chose to enter into the limitations of humanity, to enter into our finiteness, to enter into a body that could be frail and ultimately was killed on a cross, to enter into the limitations of how many people we could have relationships with, to observing the Sabbath, to all of our limitations, including our greatest limitation, and that is our sinful heart that continues to try to be the king or the queen over our lives. It continues to try to say, no, God, I got this on my own. I don't need you. And Jesus even took that on when he died on that cross that every limitation of our humanity was taken upon him so that our limitations no longer have to define us but that we could receive his peace that passes understanding even in the midst of the chaos. And so this morning, this Christmas season, what are you worried about? What are you stressed about? Do not worry. Seek first his kingdom, and all you need, including peace, will be given to you, and he is pleased to give it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, when we look at our lives, we do look at a a tendency to toil and work and labor and try to piece together so many things and to strive to be in control, and yet when we pause and we look at our life, we see the fallacy of it, that we aren't in control. There's so many things that are beyond us that we can't be perfect in in all these ways that we seem to strive to be perfect. And so, Lord, this morning we want to get off the hamster wheel. We want to get out of this, this posture of worry and anxiety and frantic living. We want to embrace a different rhythm where we can seek you, where we can seek your kingdom, where we can receive what we need from your hands, where we can be content and calm and confident that you're going to work out the details of our lives. Lord, may we receive our peace from you. And may we extend it to others. In Jesus' name, amen.